Hi and welcome. In this video, we're going to take a look at recurrence relations. We're going to review some of the basic concepts behind them and then we'll get to solving some problems. So we want to recall that a, first of all, a sequence is an ordered list of values. For example, 0, 5, 10, 15, uh, etc. We could probably figure out the pattern is that we're adding 5 to the previous value to get the next value. Um, we're going to denote values in the sequence by a, a variable name and a subscript that denotes what term in that sequence we're talking about. So for example, here we can see that x0 is 0, x1 is 5, x2 is 10, and x3 is 15. In to actually write the sequence as, as a function of the previous value, so we'll often see something like xn minus 1. n minus 1 just refers to the previous value. So we can read this right here as to, to get the next value, what do I have to do to the previous value? For this sequence up here, we uh, observed in words that we have to take the previous value and add 5 to it to get the next value. And just to show that that works, um, if we know that x0 is, that has to be given, that's what we call the initial condition. Once that initial condition is given, that starts the domino effect, and now we can start computing the next term. So x1 would be x0 plus 5, according to our rule that we wrote here. And since x0 is 0, uh, 0 plus 5 gives us the next term in the sequence, which is our x1. In a similar fashion, x2 will be the previous value, x1 plus 5. x1 we calculated to be 5, and 5 plus 5 is 10. And we can go on and list as many terms in the sequence as we would like. This is an example of a recurrence relation where we relate a general term to other terms that precede it. The well-known Fibonacci sequence is a good example of one. In this case, the Fibonacci uh, sequence, to get the next term in the sequence, we have to add together the previous two terms. So um, this is defined for two initial conditions. So we have two initial conditions. Let's say f0 equals 1, f1 equals 1. So to find f4, well, if I know f0 and f1, the next value that I have to get is f2. And f2 is going to be, that's the next term, that's going to be the previous term, which is f1, plus the previous previous term, which is f0. And since those are given to me as 1 and 1, I know that the next term in the sequence is going to be 2. To get f3, I have to take f2 and add f1 to it. Well, f2 I just calculated as 2 f1 is given to me as 1, so the next term in the Fibonacci sequence is 3. Um, so we want to stop at f4, and f4 is going to be f3 plus f2. f3 is 3, f2 is 2, and so the fourth, or rather the fifth term in the Fibonacci sequence is 5. So we have the sequence, we could write out the first few terms as 1, 1, 2, 3, and 5. Those would be the first five terms in that sequence. Now we start with F0, which is why F4 is actually the fifth term in the sequence. Um, oftentimes we have a sequence and we want to write a recursive function for it. So if we look at this one where the terms in the sequence are 1, 4, 13, 40, and 121, I want to study this and see how is the next term generated from the previous term? So we can, I encourage you to stop the video and think about this for a little while. I can see that the, the spacing between them is not consistent. So here from one to four, that's a change of three, but then the next change is nine and then 27. But I do see that if I uh, multiply the previous term by three and add one, I'm gonna get the next term in the sequence. So 1 times 3 is 3 plus 1 is 4. 4 times 3 is 12 plus 1 is 13. 13 times 3 is 39 plus 1 is 40. So I'm seeing that to get the next term in the sequence, I have to triple the previous term in the sequence 
and add one to it in order to get the next term. And again, we could just double check this. We could see that if I put in three times 40 to get the next term, three times 40 is 120 plus one is 121. So that's an example of actually writing out the sequence. Now, in some cases, we have information leading to how we get the next term, and we have to just write that function. So the Thompsons are purchasing a new house costing 200000 with a down payment of $25,000 and a 30-year mortgage. Interest on the unpaid balance of the mortgage is to be compounded at the monthly rate of 1%, and the monthly payments will be 1800 How much will the Thompsons owe after n months of payments? Right, this is a recurrence relation where BN is the balance next month and BN minus one is the balance from the previous month. So to get the new balance, I first of all have to take into account two things. So if I think about my mortgage as being sort of this box full of money that I owe, I have to think about what's changing my balance in terms of what's going in and what's going out. So. The first thing that I, I should observe is that every month I'm being charged interest and that's my monthly rate of 1%. Now, when we talk about um, interest, interest is always based on what you owe. So to figure out how much I'm going to add to my balance, I have to take 1% of whatever my balance was coming into that next month. So 1% of my previous month's balance is going to be added to my balance because the bank is gonna charge me interest on that. But that balance is not just gonna grow, it's also going to go down based on the fact that I'm gonna make $1,800 payments. So putting these two things together, I can see that my next month's balance will be, um, I'm sorry, not 1%, uh, my balance will grow by 1%, but it'll be 101% of what it was the previous month. So if I take my previous balance and I multiply it by 1.01, .01, that gives me 101%, which makes sense because I'm gonna still owe what I owed the previous month, but I'm gonna owe 1% more. And then I'm gonna decrease that balance by $1,800. And that is my recurrence relation for this particular problem. Now, ultimately what we wanna be able to do is we want to say, for example, how much am I gonna owe in 30 or 40 or 50 months. In order to do that, we're gonna to have to come up with a method with which to solve these recurrence relations. That is to go from a recurrence relation into a function that basically just inputs the month number and outputs the total balance at that time. So that's what we're gonna to get to here shortly. Now, a couple of things that we're going to need are the uh, sum of the first n whole positive whole numbers. So, for example, if you added 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5, you could do that by hand. 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5, which that comes out to 9 plus 3 is 12, 14, that comes out to 15. That's a lot of work. I have to add together five different numbers. This shortcut gives me a way to compute that sum without having to actually add. So I'm gonna double check, does this give me the same answer as if I were to take the value of n? So here the value of n is five, that's just the last term in my sequence. So if I take five times five plus one, and I divide that result by two, that comes out to five times six, which is 30 divided by two, that comes out to 15, and 15 does equal 15. So we see that this uh, shortcut seems to work. Now another one that we need is what we call the geometric series. This is called a, these are called series whenever you take the terms of, of a sequence and you add them together, that's now called a series. So it's the sum of terms within a sequence. So we're going to use a method to actually solve these recurrence relations. Um, so again, what we want to be able to do to solve a recurrence relation is at first, we have to start over here at our initial condition. Let's just say that we start with n equals zero and we want to get over here to n equals 10. So to get there, um, I would have to go 
one iteration at a time. And I'd have to go to n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, all the way up to getting to n equals 10. I'd have to do one computation at a time to generate the next terms in the series, uh, the sequence. What we want to be able to do is we want to ask the question, is there a way to just knowing the value of n to have some nice formula where we could plug it in and get the final value out of that se sequence? So let's look at problem two and see how we might do this. This is called the method of iteration where we use look for patterns and we try to write an expression for how to determine the nth term in a, in a uh, recurrence relation. So to do this, let's, let's first start by, um, we're going to kind of do this iteratively, meaning we're going to look at one term at a time. So for our problem in number two, we noticed that to get the next term, we had to triple the previous term and add one to it. So you can imagine that getting to x100, that would take a lot of effort, right? We'd have to basically do 99 iterations to get us to x100. Instead of doing it that way, um, let's look at the first few terms of the series, of the sequence, excuse me. So to get x1, we have to take 3 times x0 and add 1. Now, to get x2 symbolically, we have to take 3 times x1 and add 1 to it. But here's the thing. x1 is actually equal to this expression right here. So that means anywhere I see an x1, I can replace it with that. So that means this is going to be three times my x1, which is what I have here in this box. So I'm going to take this guy and I am going to plug it in there. Oops, I don't want to do that. Let's just write it down. So this is going to be three times x naught plus one. Whoops. So three times x naught plus one. And then I have this plus one on the outside. That's that guy. So if one thing that we want to do here is we want to, we, we don't want to write this as nine. We're going to instead distribute this out and we're going to write it as three squared times x naught plus three plus one. That's how I get x2. To get x3, I've got to take three times x2 plus one. Okay, now again, I'm going to use the same substitution. I see x2 is equal to this block here. So I'm going to make that substitution for x2. So x2 is going to be replaced with 3 squared times x naught plus 3 plus 1. And if I simplify that, I get 3 cubed, the distribution of 3 to 3 squared. And 3 to 3 will give me um, plus Again, I'm going to leave that as 3 squared plus 1. So I can kind of imagine what x4 would look like. I think based on this pattern, I see that x4 will probably be 3 to the 4th times x naught plus 3 cubed plus 3 squared and then finally plus 1. So it looks like what I'm going to have is a basically a series of three, two, so we'll have the, the, the current index right here is going to be the power on the three that acts as the coefficient of x naught. And then I'm going to have a series of descending powers attached to three, three to the third, three squared, and then my final term will be um, plus Ooh, you know what? This should be plus 3 to the first plus 1. And the reason for that is because I forgot to write the plus 1 inside of the parentheses here. So this should actually be plus 1, all plus 1. So that would give me a 3 to the first power here because I'd have the 3 times 1. And then I have that extra 1 lying on the outside. So x4 would be the same type of pattern, but I'd have descending powers down to 3 to the first and then plus 1. So in the next video, we'll see how we can use this to help us.